Okay, everyone, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, we are going to start, uh, we'll do the skull, some major landmarks of the skull. We'll do the spine and we'll do the ribs. All right, that'll be one video. And then we'll create another video on the appendicular skeleton. Maybe one video for the upper extremity and then another video for lower or just one for the entire appendicular depending on the length of time. Okay, so let's, let me do a screen share here. And let's bring up this PowerPoint. All right, so we're gonna be doing the skull first. And I know many students, sometimes they, they purchase an inexpensive skull. They have cheap ones on eBay and Amazon. Um, every now and then I may bring up one of mine. This is a, a, real, uh, a real skull. Um, I use it to show my patients. And you can see it's, it's not in the best condition. Um, they sell them very expensive if they have all their teeth. Okay, so this one was fairly inexpensive. You could see it's missing the top, but it's pretty good for showing different landmarks inside where the brain would sit. Um, so I may end up using this. Um, I'll show you some real vertebrae that I have, a real atlas and a real axis, which would be C1 and C2 vertebrae. Whoop, there we go. How you shake your head? No, it's always C1 and C2 interesting dynamic of that incredible hole inside where the brainstem sits in. Um, I'll show you the interrelationship here of a motor unit where you can see two vertebrae with two discs and you can see the nerve roots coming out between. So I may use those as, uh, as reference, okay? All right, so we're gonna look at some of the superficial landmarks. First of the skull, we'll go through some of the sutures, the lambdoidal suture, coronal, sagittal, and squamous or squamosal suture. So when we look from a bird's eye view, looking down in the sagittal plane, right, we have the sagittal suture running from A to P or P to A, anterior to posterior. And the sagittal suture is gonna separate the paired parietal bone. This is the left parietal bone and the right parietal bone. So sagittal suture, and then we have a coronal, coronal goes across, coronal suture. The coronal suture is going to separate the frontal bone from the two parietal bones. Okay, and again, bird's eye view looking down right at the tip of the nose right there, you could see the nasal bone, and you could see the top of the jaw right here, the maxillary bone, which is pointing to here, right? Right to the, the tip here. Another close up view. Uh, this is now looking at it from not anterior, but it's showing posterior. We can see those two mastoid processes. These are the two mastoid processes right there. So sagittal suture, again, you can see the two parietal bones. Since this is the posterior view, we can see the left and right parietal. Now this bone is the occiput bone or occipital bone. And what separates the occipital bone from the two parietal bones is another suture called the lambdoidal suture, lambda, lambda, lambda lambdoidal suture. And then here is a mastoid process. You can actually feel it if you find your earlobes and then you push just behind it. There's the bump on both sides. Those are the mastoid processes. Significance of the mastoid, a very important muscle is going to attach here, the sternocleidomastoid when, or the SCM muscle. Sterno for sternum, clido for clavicle, and then mastoid for mastoid process, sternocleidomastoid, SCM. Again, you can see the two parietal bones from the back. Here's the occipital bone, the occipital bone with the lambdoidal suture. Here's your sagittal suture 
Here's your frontal bone. This is the front, there's the nose, nasal bone, two parietals, and the occipital bone with the lambdoidal separating the two parietals from the occipital. From the bird's eye view, we could see the zygomatic bone or the zygomatic arch, which is the upper cheekbone, which we can see here. Zygomatic arch or the zygomatic bone. It has a few different parts to it. So we'll go through that with you. Uh, if you look on the picture on the left here, you can see the mastoid process and deep to it, if we move medial, right, let's see, if we move medial right here is the styloid process. Again, here's the styloid process and the mastoid process. Let's see if I can use the pen there. Pen color, let's use blue. So right here is a styloid process and here is the styloid process. There's the mastoid process. All right. Um, let's look at the uh, sagittal view here. This is the front, so this is the frontal bone parietal bone, occipital bone, and right where the ear is, this is the temporal bone. This suture right here, let me bring out a blue color for that again, blue. So right here, this is the squamosal suture or squamous suture. This is the coronal suture, and this is part of the lambdoidal suture, okay? Uh, here is the maxilla, which is the upper jaw, whereas the mandible is the lower jaw. And then here's the zygomatic bone, which is the upper cheekbone. You can see a little bit of the nasal bone from the side view as well. When we look at the skull from the front, let me bring, see if I could bring up the pen again. Here's the frontal bone right here. Here is the nasal bone. Now, if you look at the nose, right here, this bottom portion right there is called the vomer. That's the vomer. Now, as we go upward a little bit more superior right here, that's called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. It's kind of like a continuation of the vomer. The perpendicular plate is gonna come right up here and is gonna create a little bit of an extension. So when the top of the skull is cut off and we look down, we're gonna see a little extension come right up there in a little circle called the cribriform plate. And that extension coming up is called a Christogala. Okay, just Keep that as a mental note. When we see Christogallo, we're gonna know it's just an extension of this coming straight up, okay? Uh, here's the zygomatic bone. On the side is your temporal bone. Bottom of the jaw is your mandible. Top jaw is the maxilla. And within the nose, we have what's called concha or turbinates. Concha, there is an inferior, middle, and superior concha. Here on the bottom, we could see the inferior nasal concha. Uh, the concha or turbinates, when we breathe air in through the nose, there's three turbinates. It acts as a turbine where it spins the air. As we breathe in, it spins it and warms it. And if there's any debris, it makes it stick to the mucous membranes inside the nose. The back of the eye, this is called the sphenoid bone. All of this back here is part of the sphenoid. We have it here as well. And lateral to the nasal bone, right here is the lacrimal bone. And I'll show you the ethmoid uh, bone as well. We could see it from here. Let me get the pen going one more time. We'll make it blue. So here's the nasal bone. Here's the lacrimal bone, lacrimal like your tear ducts. Here's the ethmoid. And then here 
going to the back of the eye is going to be the sphenoid. Frontal bone, parietal bone. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Back here, occipital bone. Here's your mastoid process. And then right there, you can see the styloid process. This hole for the ear is called the external auditory meatus, EAM, external auditory meatus. Again, the top of the jaw is the maxilla, the bottom is the mandible. There's a hole right here in the mandible called the mental foramen. Remember, anytime there's a foramen, it's a hole and nerves will go through it. Mental foramen. This right here is called the mandibular condyle. The mandibular condyle, that would be this part of the mandible. This is the mandibular condyle right here. And this is called the coronoid process. Coronoid process. Not to be confused with the coracoid process. Mandibular condyle, coronoid process. The hole here and here. Mental foramen. Mental foramen. Okay. Um, when we look at the underneath surface of the skull, right, this is looking inside. When we look at the bottom, this large hole right here is the foramen magnum. And what's going to go through if the brain sits in here, the brain stem comes through. Okay, right from the bottom. And then we're going to have the top bone, C1, is going to articulate with that. Okay. So the hole at the bottom, magnum foramen. And then just next to it, right here and here, these are called the occipital condyles. These occipital condyles are rounded in contour. Let's see if you can see it here. And it's a perfect condylar shape to articulate with the top of the atlas vertebra. So it's perfect fit for nodding of the skull for this type of movement. Those are called the occipital condyles. And let me bring the pen up here. So we can see one is gonna be here and the other occipital condyles here. This is the magnum foramen or foramen magnum. That's where the medulla oblongata is gonna travel through. This little hole right here is called the jugular foramen. We're gonna go through all the foramen and understand what cranial nerves go through there, what structures go through there. Let's see what else I want to show you here from the bottom. Let's look at this view here, looking at it straight in. So here's the front. So remember where I said that perpendicular plate right here, that vomer becomes the perpendicular plate and then comes right up and creates an extension? Well, you could see it right there. That's called a crista gala. And if I pull that a little bit closer, you're going to see a bunch of little holes in there. Those little holes, like punched out needle holes, that is in an area called a cribiform plate where there are olfactory bulbs for the sense of smell, the olfactory nerve, your first cranial nerve is going to go through there. Okay, so 
Here is the cribriform plate, right? It's this area right there. You can see all the punched out holes. And the Christagalla or Christagalli, that's that extension of the perpendicular plate, which is an extension of the vomer going straight up. This right here is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. And then this right here is the greater wing of the sphenoid. The sphenoid means like butterfly or bat, the bat bone. It looks like the wings of a bat. We're going to see a few other holes, a few other foramen here. There is the foramen rotundum right there. We will see a foramen rotundum, a foramen ovale, uh, which we could see. This is the foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, and then there's another one called the spinosum. Here is the internal acoustic meatus. Remember out here was the external acoustic meatus. That's the internal acoustic meatus. And this portion here is called a petrous portion of the temporal bone. And what that is, if we show you, here's an ear. And this area right here is the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And if I remove it, what's there is a very, very important part of the ear. It's where you have something called the semicircular canals for balance and equilibrium. The hearing center is there as well. The cochlear, looks like the snail, and then these three semicircular canals or vestibular canals for balance. But the petrous portion of the temporal bone is right here. And there's this magical thing that that stibular apparatus that's there, okay? So that's the petrous portion of the temporal bone, internal acoustic meatus. The external is on the outside. That's the whole of the ear. Here and here, those are the optic canals. The optic canals is for the optic nerve to travel through. You can see it here. Here and here. That goes to the eyes. They kind of make a crisscross. Let me see if I can show that to you a little bit better. I'm going to use these two sticks right here. And I'm going to put one through here. You can see it coming through the eye. And I'm going to put the other one through here. And what I want you to notice, there it is. So right there is the optic canal. And the sticks would be the optic nerves and exactly how they crisscross like that. They make an X right at this structure called the hypophyseal fossa or cella tersica, means Turkish saddle. And if we look at it from the front view, you can see where they both come through the eyes, those holes. That would be the optic nerve going through the optic canal. But where they crisscross, that X is called a chiasm, the optic chiasm. And if I remove this and I remove this, right here is a depression. Right, it's a very smooth depression where my finger is, right there. You know what sits right in this hypophyseal fossa or cella tersica, that Turkish saddle? Your pituitary gland. Your pituitary gland sits there. So if there's a pituitary tumor and it enlarges, it's going to put pressure on the optic nerves affecting vision, okay?
Okay, here's the mandibular condyle. This is the mandible. Let me go back a second. Right here, these two holes in the front are the mental foramen. Let me go back a second to the front of the skull. I wanna see if I can show you something here. Yes, I can. So if we look, I'm gonna do this in red. Let's change the color of the pen here uh, to red. So right here and right here and then right here. Those three, I'm going to put V1 and then V2 and then here I'll put V3. The V is for Roman numeral five for the fifth cranial nerve. It's called a trigeminal. Tri because it has three divisions, an ophthalmic to the eye, maxillary division to the maxilla, and mandibular division to the mandible. This hole above the orbit of the eye is called the supraorbital foramen. Below the eye, infraorbital foramen. So you have a supraorbital foramen, an infraorbital foramen, and then a mental foramen. So the first division, V1, of the trigeminal nerve comes out through the, or the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve comes out through the supraorbital foramen. And then the second division, or the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve comes out through the infraorbital foramen. And then the mandibular division, or the third division of cranial nerve, of a trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, goes through the mental foramen, V1, V2, V3. This is the cranial nerve. When you go to the dentist and you have a cavity, they use Novocaine to numb that trigeminal nerve so half your face goes numb, whether they're working on the upper jaw or lower jaw. Even half your tongue goes numb, okay, because your tongue is also innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So there are 12 cranial nerves and we'll go through the 12 pairs of cranial nerves uh, in just a little bit. Okay, this is the hyoid bone, which is somewhere here in the throat. It's actually the only bone in the body that does not create a joint. It doesn't articulate with any other bone. There's just lots of muscles that attach there. When we do muscles, you'll hear uh, sternohyoid, geniohyoid uh, bones, omohyoid bones. So there's a greater horn, a lesser horn, and a body of the hyoid bone. Okay, when we look at the sternum, right, the breastbone here, the sternum has three divisions. Let's see if I can highlight that. We'll do it in blue. There's this upper portion here called a manubrium. Then there is the body of the sternum here. And then there's this bottom portion called the xiphoid process. So there's the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process of the sternum. And you'll notice that on the upper ribs, ribs one through seven, they are called true ribs because they have their own individual cartilage attaching to the sternum. Whereas ribs eight through 12 towards the bottom, they're called false ribs because they have shared cartilage. You can see they share cartilage going to the sternum. And then the last two ribs, 11 and 12, are called floating ribs. Why? They don't have any cartilage attaching to the sternum. They just float. All 12 pairs of ribs, there's 12 pairs of ribs, they attach to the thoracic spine. So when we look at the spine, here's the sacrum, the pelvis, here's the lumbar spine. There's five lumbars, five, four, three, two, one. And now we have 12 thoracics. So here's L5, L4, L3, L2, L1. This is our 12th thoracic, T12, T11, T9, T8, T7, 
T6, T5, T4, T3, T2, and T1. So from T1 to T12 is where those pairs of ribs attach. They attach to the transverse processes. There's gonna be these facets in which the ribs are going to attach and swing around to the front to protect the lungs and to protect part of the heart. All right, so this is why the spine is used and the ribs to assess scoliosis because if there's rotation of the thoracic spine, there's gonna be rotation of the ribs. So either the nurse or your doctor of chiropractic would go to high schools and they would ask you to bend down and touch your toes and the doctor or the nurse would be looking at your rib cage to see if one was higher than the other. They call that Adam's test. And we're assessing the integrity of your, your ribs and how they articulate or attach to the spine. If there's rotation or scoliosis of the thoracic spine, we're gonna see rotation of the rib cage. Okay? So you can see here in the middle, there's your T12 and T11 vertebra. So that's your T11 rib and T12 rib. Those are floaters. There's no cartilage there. So there's your uh, manubrium up at top. Let's do, let's do red here. So here is the manubrium. And then there's the body. And then the tip is the xiphoid process. All the way at the top here, this is called the jugular notch. And this is the clavicular notch. What do you think is gonna attach to the clavicular notch is the medial aspect of the clavicle. The lateral aspect of the clavicle is gonna articulate with the acromion process of the scapula. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit. Between the manubrium and the body of the sternum is this sternal angle, also called the angle of Louis. If you feel the sternal notch or the jugular notch, jugular notch or sternal notch, and you go down about three to four finger breaths, you're gonna feel a angle or a sharp ridge that goes across. Mine's right there. Right? If you strum up and down like the strings of a guitar, you're going to feel a bump. That bump is that sternal angle or angle of Louis. And when you palpate that, whether you go to the left or to the right, you're going to get to a rib on both sides. That is your second rib. And if you go down one finger breath, you're in a space. That's the second intercostal space. Then the third rib. Then the third intercostal space then the fourth rib and the fourth intercostal space. The reason why counting ribs is important is it allows you to use the stethoscope to place the diaphragm or the bell, not over the bone, but over the intercostal space where you can hear lung sounds better and even heart sounds where you can hear the shutting of the valves. Okay, so that angle of Louis or sternal angle becomes an important superficial palpatory landmark because if you can locate it and go across, that's the second rib. Go down one finger breath, second intercostal space. Another finger breath, third rib. Another breath, the next intercostal space. Rib, intercostal space. Rib, intercostal space. Okay. Let's look at the spine here, the vertebral column. I may go into another PowerPoint to show that, but since it's here, I want you to look at this and what you can see is that we have different curves. If we look at the neck, we have this cervical curve that goes this way, that's called a lordosis, and it's the same direction as the, lumb, the lower back. So there are two lordotic curves. There's a cervical lordosis and a lumbar lordosis. If you have an increased curvature, we call that a cervical hyperlordosis. If there's an increased lumbar curvature, we would call that a lumbar hyperlordosis. If we see that the curve in the neck is gone from a nice C-shaped and it becomes less C-shaped, they call it a hypolordosis.
same holds true for the lumbar spine. If it's not a nice C-shaped curve and it's losing it, becoming a little bit straighter, they call it a hypolordotic lumbar curve. If it becomes perfectly straight, they say it's a military spine, whether that's cervical or lumbar. If it goes the opposite way in the cervical or lumbar, they'll call that a reversal of the lordosis, or they'll call it a kyphosis. The thoracic curve is kyphosis, and the sacral curve is kyphosis. If you have an increased kyphotic curve, they'll call it a hyperkyphosis. That's if someone has that hunched back. If the sacral tilt is increased, they'll call it a hyperkyphotic sacral curve. If you increase curves or decrease curves in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine, it will typically result in degeneration or arthritis. So this is a healthy vertebrae. Look at the discs, nice and healthy. Then here, actually, let me keep it on my, mod, on my magnetic model. Let me just show you what it looks like here. So this is textbook healthy. Look at the disc here, it's a little bit compressed. Look at it here, you start to see a little bone spurs, also known as osteophytes, and then it further progresses where the osteophytes from the bone above and below actually touch and they kiss and you have a natural fusion that takes place. The danger of that, if I turn it from the side, you could see that the hole where the nerve comes through is quite open. If I go here and we look at that hole where the nerve comes through, if the disc space is diminishing, the hole where the nerve comes through is even smaller. Then if I turn it again and we look here, now we have an unhealthy nerve that's getting pinched and here in the later stages, even worse. And keep in mind, these nerves go to muscles, they go to organs. And if you have a pinched nerve, wherever that organ is going to, there's gonna be less life getting there. If it's a pinch up here, you get radiating or radicular pain and numbness and tingling into the hands. If it happens in the lower back, you get that sciatica or numbness and tingling and muscle weakness to the lower extremity. So here's a a view of the very, very top bone that's called the atlas, which looks like this. Now, an atlas compared to a typical vertebrae look very, very different. There are some big differences there. So when we look at a atlas, there's an anterior arch and a posterior arch. On the sides, we have transverse processes. If you look next to the transverse processes on both sides, you're gonna see two holes. It's called transverse foramen. Now what runs through the transverse foramen is a very important artery on the left side of the neck and the right side of the neck called the vertebral artery. Vertebral artery comes off the heart and it goes up one to the left, one to the right. The vertebral artery has an important job to bring blood, oxygen, and glucose into the brain, okay? Notice there's no spinous process. So here on a lumbar vertebra, there's a body, a vertebral body, there's transverse processes, and there's a spinous process. Well, you don't see a spinous process here. You see a posterior arch. This is looking at the underneath surface of the atlas. So here is the top, here is the bottom. So anytime two vertebrae touch one another, they have to articulate with facets. So on the bottom is the inferior articulating facet, and on the top is the superior articulating facet. Superior articulating facet, inferior articulating facet. We have them on all vertebrae. Since we're looking at this one from the inferior surface, you can see on the top right, it says Atlas, which is C1. Atlas, the Greek god that holds up the world. So that has to be the inferior articulating facet. Here's a typical 
cervo cervical vertebrae. So if we look at typical cervical vertebrae, they're gonna have some key landmarks here. There is a vertebral body, and what sits on the body, what sits here is gonna be the intervertebral disc, the IVD, right? That's gonna be this structure here. That's gonna sit in between the vertebrae. That's the IVD or the intervertebral disc. We are going to see transverse process, TP. So here's a TP and here's a TP. The hole in the middle is the transverse foramen where the vertebral artery goes through. Here is the spinous process. Many of them in the cervical spine, they're called bifid because it may look like this. It may have that little split in the middle, so they call it a bifid spinous process. Um, here is the superior articulating facet. We're looking at it from above. And then on the underneath side, all the way on the bottom would be the inferior articulating facet, but you can't quite see it because we're looking at it from the top view. Here's the other superior articulating facet. Now here's the vertebral foramen. What do you think is going to go through the vertebral foramen? That's the spinal cord. So you can understand why if a disc herniates and pushes, it can push right up against the spinal cord, or it can push up against the nerves coming out from the side. So now we're looking at a vertebra from not the top, not from the bottom, but this way. So now from this particular view, you can see both the superior articulating facet and then on the bottom here would be the inferior articulating facet. But the process is called an inferior articular process. From the back here, I'm going to outline it, but that is the spinous process. And here we can see it's bifid, it's split. Bifid spinous. I'm going to show you here this is a c2 vertebra if i turn it this way you could see it's bifid see how it's split this is c2 this is the superior articulating facet which is let's put this on here So here is C2, right? It's got that odontoid process. It's the only one that has the dens. Here is the C1, and it's going to fit like that perfectly. So you could see that the C1 doesn't have a spinous process. It has a posterior arch and an anterior arch. But C2 has a spinous process that's bifid. Notice there's also no disc between C1 and C2. The first disc is actually between C2 and C3. Here's a thoracic vertebra. Let's look at some of the parts there. Again, we have a vertebral body. We have a spinous process. On the outsides, we have the transverse processes. Uh, we also have the vertebral foramen. That's where the spinal cord travels. Now, from the vertebral body right here on both sides, there's this bridge or connection and this bridge or connection. Those are called pedicles. Those are called pedicles. Because we're looking at this from the top view, it says it's the superior view. This is the superior articulating facet. So the superior articulating facet is going to articulate with an inferior articulating facet from the vertebra above it, right? So if I look at these two here, that's anterior, that's posterior because these are the spinous processes. Here, right there, this is the superior articulating facet of this bone. 
And then that is the inferior articulating facet of the one above. So we have an inferior and superior articulating facet that are attaching to each other. Okay, here's a lumbar vertebra. Again, same structures. We have a lumbar uh, vertebral body. We have a spinous process. We have transverse processes on both sides. We have a vertebral foramen. We have pedicle going this way, another pedicle going this way. And then we have this here. Actually, let me see if I can, let me change the color. Let's make this one red. We'll make it green. This and this, these are lamina. Two lamina come together, they fuse and they form the spinous process. Laminas come together and form the spinous process. Okay. Let's look at it from the side view. We'll make this blue. So now we're looking at this. This is a lumbar vertebra. The lumbar have the largest vertebral bodies and the shortest knobbiest spinous process, but they're, they're heavy bones. So this is the vertebral body from the side view. This is the pedicle. Transverse processes, right? From this view, they stick out, but when you turn it this way, it just looks like a little circle, but this way they stick out from the posterior view or from the anterior view. But when you turn it this way, you lose that depth perception. So that's the transverse processes. And now, this is really nice. You could see it pretty good here. This is the superior articulating process, and then there's an inferior articulating process. And then on each process, that's where you have the facets. So this smooth surface is the inferior articulating facet. And then on the inside of there, on the inside though, that would be the superior articulating facet. Then you have a short knobby transverse process. So when you see the short knobby uh, spinous process and a large vertebral body, that's a lumbar vertebra. When you see bifid spinous processes, that's a cervical vertebrae. When you look at the transverse, uh, sorry, when you look at the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae, it's like a nose. It projects downward. The spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra project downward. You can see that whereas the transverse processes go upward. That's a unique feature. And then you have the sacrum, the bottom bone. In the sacrum, you've got those, hold, those holes called sacral foramina. The base of the sacrum, the sacral base is on top here. This is the sacral base. This is the sacral apex. These are the sacral foramina. Okay, let me, before we get into the appendicular, let's see if I can get out of here. And I wanna go into this PowerPoint, which is gonna show the spine again. So we could see the cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, and sacral kyphosis again. How do these curves form? So when you're a baby this, and you're in your mother's womb, there's only one curve. It is called a primary curve. That primary curve is this thoracic curve, right? Because you're in your mother's womb, you're all curled up, then you're born, then you start crawling. When you crawl, you lift your head up. And when you lift your head up, you start to form that cervical curve. And when you're crawling, your belly is hanging down and that forms the lumbar curve. So when we look at the spine, when it forms properly, there's a lumbar curve, a thoracic curve, 
and then again, a cervical curve. It's a wave because energy moves in waves. We don't want to lose the cervical curve. We don't want this, you know, from the side, texting neck. When you get texting neck, it's going to lead to degeneration or arthritis, guaranteed, but you're straightening the curve. And when the brain sends the mental impulses or the brain waves down, energy has to move in waves like this. So if the cervical spine becomes militant, the body's going to want to compensate for the lack of that cervical lordosis. So the body's going to create a scoliosis in the other direction when your spine looks like an S. The innate intelligence is super smart of the body. It knows if it's altering the cervical curve in this plane, it's going to create an S in the other plane to try and still allow that energy to move. All right, so let's take a look and review some of these structures again. Let's make this, we'll make it red. So here's the vertebral body on the top. Here's the vertebral foramen where the spinous, uh, where the spinal cord travels. This is the spinous process. This is the transverse process. Again, on the bottom, vertebral body, vertebral foramen, spinous process, transverse process. Between each vertebra is an intervertebral disc. You can see IVD, intervertebral disc. Here's the spinous process. Here is the superior articulating process. This is the superior articulating facets. Here is an inferior articulating process with an inferior articulating facet. And they both, here's an inferior articulating facet and a superior one. They have to articulate to form that joint. The cushion right here, that's the intervertebral disc. If that intervertebral disc gets narrowed, then this hole called the intervertebral foramen where the nerves come through get encroached or become narrow. If a disc pushes back this way and starts to compress the spinal cord, they call that spinal stenosis. This is when you see people walking with that antalgic lean forward, right? Sometimes you see a lot of older senior citizens walking with that bend at their hip forward. That's called an antalgic gait, an anterior antalgic gait. And it usually takes a lot of tension off of the spinal cord for those people. So you can see the vertebral body. Here is the, this would be, a pedicle, a pedicle. This would be a lamina. Lamina, when the lamina is fused, they create a spinous process. Here's your transverse processes. From the side view, there's your transverse process, side view, spinous process. And this is probably a lumbar vertebra because of that short, stubby spinous process and huge, large vertebral body. This extension here coming off, that's your pedicle. This is your superior articulating process, and then the facet would be there. And then here is the inferior articulating facet on the inferior articulating process. An inferior view, spinous process, transverse process, vertebral foramen, vertebral body, two pairs of pedicles, lamina, lamina, lamina is fused. When they fuse, it forms the spinous. If the lamina don't come together, the spinous never fuses and you get a spina bifida. It just never closes. Okay, let's look at that C1, C2 articulation. So here, we're gonna be showing you this. 
C1 and C2. Remember, C2 has that bump called the dens or odontoid process. That's the axis or C2. And C1 is going to sit right on top of it. So you can shake your head no, like this. Rotation takes place there. What holds it in place, if you look on the bottom right, here is the dens of the axis, right? So here's your axis, here's your atlas. And the axis off the vertebral body has the odontoid process or the dense. And then you have this transverse ligament going across that holds it in place. What travels through there is the medulla, which is the lower end of the brainstem. If you look on the top left, there's your nice cervical curve, that lordosis. C1 is atlas, C2 is axis. Remember, there's no disc between C1 and C2. The first disc is here between C2 and C3. The last cervical vertebra has the largest spinous process. That's your C7. Uh, Atlas has the widest transverse process of the spine. It's pretty neat. They all have holes called transverse foramen. You can see here on the bottom right, there's a transverse foramen, there's a transverse foramen for the vertebral arteries to go through. This shows, uh, here's a lamina, here's a lamina. The lamina has come to form that vertebral arch, but when they close, you get the spinous process. Once you see the bifid spinous, we know it's a cervical vertebrae, vertebral body, Pedicle, pedicle, transverse foramen, transverse foramen, vertebral foramen, what goes through the vertebral foramen, that would be your spinal cord. And then the spinal cord has nerves, one comes out this way and the other one's gonna come out this way. So if we have a disc that starts to herniate or bulge, let's say the disc is here, and it starts to push out this way, zing, you're gonna get this radiating pain down this nerve. If the disc starts to herniate out the other way and it hits that nerve, zing, down the other extremity. Or it's gonna push back and hit the actual meninges that protect the spinal cord and then eventually hit the spinal cord and compress it. That's called spinal stenosis. There's a close-up view of C1, which is the atlas. C2 is the axis. Remember, C1 does not have a spinous process. It has a posterior arch and it has an anterior arch. So there's no uh, vertebral body of C1 and there's no spinous process of C1. There's an anterior arch and a posterior arch. C2 has a vertebral body and what extends upward is the odontoid process or the dents. And you got the transverse ligament holding it in place and that's what allows you to rotate left and right. C2, however, has that bifid spinous process. Again, you can see the transverse foramen in both and both have transverse processes, of course. Now, once we go into the thoracic region, you could see up on the left, now we're looking at the lavender, the purple section. We already did the cervical. There were C7, C1 to C7. So there's seven cervical vertebrae. There's T1 to T12. So there's 12 thoracic vertebrae. And then there's L1 to L5, there's five lumbar vertebrae. Just remember, you eat at 7 a.m., 12 noon, and 5 p.m. 7, 12, and 5, breakfast, lunch, dinner. The thoracic region, if you look on the bottom right, you see how the spinous process, I said is like a nose, it goes downward, whereas the lumbar vertebra are short and stubby, and then the cervical vertebrae had that bifid bifid spinous process, okay? Different characteristics to it. But all the other parts are the same. There's still a vertebral body. There's still pedicles. 
There's still lamina. There's still a spinous, transverse processes. They're going to be superior and inferior articulating processes, superior and inferior articulating facets. But one of the unique things that we are going to see on the transverse processes are costal facets. The costal facets on the transverse process and then off the vertebral bodies, the superior costal facets, those are for the ribs. Remember I said 12 pairs of ribs, 12 thoracic vertebrae. The 12 thoracic vertebrae are there and they act as the attachment site for the 12 pairs of ribs. And they use the costal facets, one on the transverse process and the other on the vertebral body to attach to. And that's why when the thoracic spine has a scoliosis, the ribs are gonna move and rotate with it. You can see T1 to T12. Between each of those is the intervertebral foramen, and that's where the nerves are gonna come out from, okay? T1 to T12, kyphotic curvature. If it's increased, hyperkyphosis. Decreased, hypokyphosis. So there's your typical thoracic vertebrae. Again, you've got your vertebral body, vertebral foramen, lamina. Laminas fuse, they form the spinous process. You have your transverse processes. Here's your transverse costal facet, and here's your superior costal facet. Those are for the ribs. Okay. From the side view, look at that spinous process here. See how it descends down. Here is your transverse process. This is the, cost, the transverse costal facet. So that's where your rib's going to attach here and the rib is going to attach here and the rib can attach here. Pretty cool, right? And then there's your vertebral body from the side view. This would be your pedicle superior articulating facet, and then down here you'd have your inferior articulating facet. Lumbar vertebra, look at the short, stubby, knobby spinous processes, large vertebral bodies, L1 to L5. You can see the two floating ribs, right? You can see this one here. You can see this one here. So this one is T12, and the one above would be T11. Those are your two floating ribs. The others above, here's T10. You can see it's got the cartilage there. T10, T9, T8. You can see the sacrum. The sacrum is about five fused segments that come together. And then the coccyx is around three to five few segments that come together. Vertebral body, lumbar vertebrae, here's your pedicle, transverse process. There's your superior articulating process. Here's your inferior articulating process. And because it's facing us, we can see the inferior articulating facet right there. And there's the short knobby spinous process. Bird's eye view, vertebral body, vertebral foramen, two TPs, transverse process, one spinous process. Remember the laminas come together to, to form that. Here's the superior articulating facet sitting on the superior articulating process. Here's your sacral base, sacral apex. These are your sacral foramina, those holes. You can see where they start to fuse here, those transverse lines. There's no spinous processes. They're just, you can see it forms a median sacral crest right here. Median sacral crest. And remember the spinal cord ends at T12 to L1. 
everything inferior to that T12 L1 vertebra, they're just nerve roots. The spinal cord tapers at that T12, well, really, I don't want to say T12 L1, let me go back, L1 L2. I stand corrected. It's that L1 L2 interspace, which is where the spinal cord tapers and ends. So anything inferior to L2, L3, L4, and 5, those are all nerve roots only, which is why most spinal taps happen below L2. There's a close-up view. You can see the median crest, right? There's no spinous processes. It's just that medial crest. This is the sacral base. This is the sacral apex. And the coccyx is inferior to that. The auricular surface here of the sacrum, this is going to be an attachment site for the ilium, which is part of your pelvis. And they call it the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. But this is a key feature of making your sacroiliac joints. Sacral base, sacral apex, and the sacral foramina are the holes. The sacral promontory is just the most prominent part of the anterior surface. Okay, we already covered the thoracic region, but we can go over it. Here is the uh, sternum, the manubrium of the sternum, the body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process of the sternum. Now you can see the 12 pairs of ribs coming all the way down. There's 11 and 12, your floaters. One through seven are true because they have their independent cartilage going from the rib to the sternum. False ribs have shared cartilage. So the sternum on the left here has three parts, manubrium, body, and xiphoid. The last two ribs, 11 and 12, there's T12, 11 and T12. They have the floating ribs. There is no cartilage attaching to the sternum. Really nice view of showing the T1 to T12 thoracic vertebrae. You can see the ribs and how they attach to the transverse processes and a little bit in the front to the vertebral body. So we can see that if let's say T3 pulled to the left and the T4 spinous pulls to the left, if they all rotate in one direction, then the ribs have to rotate. Okay. Again, if we look at that upper view, really, really nice way of seeing how the ribs have an attachment site to the transverse process and to the vertebral body. Okay. There's a close up view. So you can see how there's attachment here and there's attachment here. So if the, if the thoracic vertebra moves, it spins and rotates, the ribs have to move with it. The ribs are gonna elevate and depress when we cover muscles. We will learn some of the muscles that elevate the ribs and depress the ribs. Okay. All right, so that's gonna bring that to a close. That's about an hour. So we're gonna end this. Let me stop the share. So what we have left, we covered the skull, some of the main parts of the skull. And we covered the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebra, the unique ones, the atypical C1 and atypical C2. Right. Once you see that, you see that dens, you know it's C2. Just remember dens, dental, looks like a tooth. C1, the atlas is going to sit right on top of it like this. Okay. If there is whiplash, martial arts, boxing, a punch to the head, which makes the head whip back, many times the odontoid process can fracture. So we would take an x-ray called an A to P open mouth. You have to open the mouth wide so the teeth 
are out of the way. If the teeth, if the mouth is closed, this gets obstructed by the teeth. If you say, ah, it opens up and then we could see the dontoid very clear to make sure it's not fractured, okay? Um, they used to call this a hangman's fracture if that axis or if the dens fractured because in the old days when they would um, try and kill someone that committed a crime or something and they would hang them, they put a noose around the neck and when the bottom section dropped, you'd have this hard, hard descent and this like bungee whiplash that takes place. And what would fracture is the dens. And when I was in school, we learned in all of my radiology books, it was called a hangman fracture. A hangman fracture is specific for an, a dens fracture of C2. When the dens fractures, this happened to Christopher Reeve, Superman. Uh, it creates paralysis because if this pushes back, it's gonna push back on what travels through here, which is the medulla or the spinal cord. And the medulla controls the heart. It controls the breathing. So all of those visceral functions will be thrown off. Okay, all right, let's bring this to an end.